Hello everyone, my name is John and this is the Mask Face Journal and this is what I read this week. Green Arrow number 7, written by Benjamin Percy and art by Stephen Byrne. This story is a bit confusing. It alternates between a flashback story with Emiko and Oliver fighting crime and being extorted by the Clock King, and a story taking place right after the whole sinking the terrorist bank cult giant floating superbase story, where Emiko and Shadow are in some sort of blood debt to the Yakuza. The reason it's confusing is because of the way they are extorted by the Clock King. Maybe I read the end of the last issue wrong, but it seemed to imply that Oliver was in some sort of secret society or had made some sort of Faustian deal, and that's why he wore that watch. But this issue seems to say that he wore that for no reason at all. In the present story, I find it very strange that Shadow never did what she does here before. You could say it's because of honor, but it still feels off. Raven number one, written by Marv Wolfman and art by Alison Borges. Marv Wolfman returns here to tell a story with the character he created way back in the day. Not being a Teen Titans reader, I'm mostly familiar with Raven through other media, specifically the Teen Titans cartoon and the recent Justice League vs. Teen Titans directed DVD movie. This story begins with Raven looking up her aunt that she previously didn't know existed and ends up staying with her and her family. She's starting high school and it's starting to feel kinda typical. But the book does subvert some expectations. I'd say that the end of the issue is fascinating. I'm not at all sure what's going on, but it's creepy and intriguing. Justice League number 5, written by Brian Hitch and art by Tony S. Daniel. On the face of it, this is a very simple story. Thing happens, Justice League shows up and stops Thing. However, it's draped in some Grant Morrison level of cosmic nonsense. Nothing that this story sets up is explained. What were those giant cosmic beings made out of people trying to achieve? What about those weird zodiac crystals that Aquaman carries around? And those earthquake machines that Superman spends three issues pushing around? What about the remnants of the alien race that got turned into cyborg lookalikes and brought to Earth en masse by the Green Lanterns? Nope, not explained, not expanded upon. Okay then. Harley Quinn number four, written by Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmiotti and art by Joseph Michael Linsner. This will probably be the last time I talk about this book, unless I do a retrospective or there's a major shift in the creative team. It's not because the book is bad or that I'm going to stop reading it, but it's increasingly difficult to find things to say about this book. It's cartoonishly silly, and nothing that the character ever does has any consequences. There's no real story going on, so the only thing I can talk about is whether I find it funny or not. In this particular case, I don't find it that funny. I also find it difficult to pay attention and often I have no idea why she's doing what she's doing. Batman number 7, plot by Steve Orlando and Tom King and art by Riley Rosmo. And Nightwing number 5, plot by Steve Orlando and Tim Seeley and art by Rogue Antonio. These are part 1 and 2 of the crossover event Night of the Monster Men. I usually hate it when comic publishers do this. It forces you to buy comics you wouldn't ordinarily buy and it makes collecting and organizing a nightmare. These two parts have kind of both set up and payoff. They're setting up a giant escalating disaster with Hugo Strange's monster men attacking the city the same night a monstrous hurricane hits it. The payoff come from the thread started in Batman number two, with the guy killing himself in Gordon's office. So far this is pretty good. I don't really feel that this is an overwhelming situation just yet, but it's still building. So we'll see what happens in the next part in Detective Comics number 941. Superman number 7, written by Peter Tomasi and art by Patrick Gleason. This book is just fun. After the long battle with the Eradicator, this is a nice breather. A family outing to the county fair for Clark, Lois and John, where Clark promises not to run away on Superman business for the entire night. It's small stories like this that makes me love Superman. The only negative thing I can come up with is that Lois's character gets kinda shortchanged. I hope that the next story will feature her more prominently and show off her strengths, because right now she's relegated to a fairly typical mother-wife role. Trinity number 1 by Francis Manipal this is a book that I've been looking forward to. I'm a huge fan of Manipal's art, and this doesn't disappoint in that department. This, like Superman number 7 before, is a quieter affair. Lois has invited Batman and Wonder Woman over for dinner so that they can start building some trust. We get some pretty decent dialogue where Diana and Bruce are getting to know this version of Lois and Clark. Interesting that this supposedly post-crisis Superman remembers some rather silly Silver Age stuff. The cliffhanger is... 
strange. I don't know how to explain it or even if I should try, but it seems like this book is going to deal with how this Superman fits into this universe and if this is another universe at all. That might just be my insane interpretation though. So that was what I read this week. Did you enjoy this video? Please like, comment and subscribe and share this video. If you didn't like it or disagree with me, please let me know in the comments. That is it for me this week.